April 2020 and the world was in lockdown and my 10 year old son and I embarked on a little project a shot-for-shot -shot remake of the iconic Channel 4 Tour de France intro. You know, the one with Pete Shelley's incredible music. And it was a distraction from the situation around us and gave us something creative to do. But whilst making this video, I realised that we made this when Zach was the exact age I was when I fell in love with bike racing. Age 10, I fell fast and I fell hard. And it has remained to this day my biggest passion. If you've followed this channel for a while, you'll know some of these stories and about my passion for pedalling but at the end of this video is a story that none of you have heard before. To say I come from a family of Francophiles would be an understatement. My dad and stepmom have lived in their remote farmhouse in the Vendée for decades now, and my bilingual brother had the first goat born at Disneyland Paris named after him. True story. Family holidays were spent driving through France, seemingly spending more time getting to places than being there. Perhaps as a distraction from the boredom, around seven or eight years old, I began to notice something alien to the UK, but ubiquitous in this foreign land, the cyclist. More graceful a marriage of man and machine than Arnie in Terminator, they appear fluid and at one with their machine, both futuristic and ancient at the same time. I was intrigued and would always search out kit in the cycling shops in the hope that there might be some kit. It wouldn't cost a million francs and it would fit me, but more often than not, I struck out three times. I'd sit on the driver's side of our car in the back so I could see any cyclist that we went past and it would go in this order. Their shoes, the frame maker's logo, the position of the down tube shifters to see their drive chain because it was on the other side, their hand position on the handlebars and then the look on their face. My mum still has notebooks filled with drawings of bike designs and lists of tour winners over the years. And most of my very limited French language skills were gained on Lissant des Magazines de Cyclisme de Français. A few years on in 1987 when I was 10, I fell so hard I knew my heart was gone forever. Bike racing became my first true love. Well, apart from Kerry Green from the Goonies. It was the 22nd of July, 1987 to be precise, stage 21 of the Tour de France. Stephen Roche had all but lost any chance of winning the Tour to Pedro Delgado. At one point on the stage, he was two minutes down as they climbed the final mountain of the day, La Plagne. Coverage of the stage winner Laurent Fignon and poor TV coverage meant that other than knowing that Roche was dropped, we didn't actually know where he was on the road. Somehow we ended up just four seconds behind Delgado that day, needing oxygen at the finishing line to recover. He went on to win the tour and that was me done for good. To give yourself completely and to be utterly committed to turning yourself inside out for what really? To win a bike race? Yeah, but it was beautiful. To be fair, Roche was beautiful and no Brit was ever going to win the Tour de France, right? That was never ever going to happen in a million years. And Roche spoke the same language as me, so it was as close as I was ever going to get. Actually, on that note, in 1998, at the finish line of the tragic Pro Tour stage in Cardiff, I finally met my hero, Stephen Roche. And I asked him about that climb on La Plagne, and he spent several minutes telling me about how he knew the climb, what he could do to make the time up, and when to go in the big ring. At least, that's what I assumed he told me. I couldn't actually understand a word of his beautiful Irish brogue, but it's what I've read he's said about the stage since. It doesn't matter. I breathed the same air as the man for a few brief moments. Oh. And that Liggett commentary, it is iconic. I later found that they cut six seconds from it to move it forwards in relation to the images for the Channel 4 broadcast that we all saw that night, as he was so surprised to see Roche that what you hear him say as he comes into shot was actually said as he crossed the line. It got Netflix decades before Unchained existed. Anyway, that was me utterly and passionately obsessed. Every summer was out on the bike pretending to be a world champ in a rugby shirt that had hoops around the middle on the five pound racing bike from my nan's copy of Luke Classifieds, then watched the tour avidly whilst milk race loaded on the Amstrad. That was me genuinely every day during the tour. The only way I could ever see people racing bikes was on Channel 4. That theme tune to this day still gives me goosebumps and pumps my blood. The 49 weeks around the tour was spent committing images and race results to memory from magazines, but it wasn't the same. Cycling is poetry in motion and the pure visual beauty of time trialing was my specific kink. But I never saw the tour with my own eyes until 2018. Stage one ended in my dad's local town, so more than three decades after my love affair began, I finally got to see it in the flesh. I've been to a lot of bike races. The tour is like nothing I've ever experienced. It's insane. More people, more equipment, more media, more infrastructure than the most major festivals I've ever played. We did the finish line for stage one, the feed zone for stage two, and the team time trial for stage three, where my youngest son was handed a bead on by Greg Van Avermaet, who would end the day in yellow. And Zach made this brilliant ident for GCN, which they never used. So finally, it gets an airing on my channel instead. 
from kilometer zero, stage two at the Tour de France, welcome to the GCN show. The videos that I made at the tour were early in the stage of my YouTube journey. Videos eight, nine, and 10 of what now total over 400 videos. Speaking of the channel, the odds are you're watching this but not subscribed. This channel's become a community that I am so proud to be part of. Subscribing, commenting, giving a thumbs up, as well as allowing the ads to play through help this channel more than you will ever know. Thanks for watching so far. Exactly a month after I posted that Channel 4 remake on YouTube, my beautiful wife Becky was diagnosed with breast cancer. An operation followed a month after to remove the tumour and then in August, the dreaded, and we were right to dread it, chemo would start for the rest of the year. Still, what else was there to do? We were all still in lockdown. But then the tour was cancelled. I was drinking too much and terrified. So I decided that every day the tour should have been on, I would ride 60 kilometers on my cheap third hand racing bike. And I did, a much needed break from the chaos in my head. Some level of fitness perhaps, not actually sure why I did it, but did it, I did. And it planted a seed of an idea in my head. So the tour in this day and age is 21 stages long and covers roughly 2,100 miles. Bex had been so looked after by a charity based at Southmead Hospital that I wanted to do something to give back, take control, and to some extent, and I was wrong here actually, try and draw a bit of a line under such a traumatic year. In 2021, I decided to ride a mirror image of the tour, day by day matching one kilometre to the pros one mile and swapping the Alps and the Pyrenees for the Mendips and the Cambrian Mountains. With the help of my composer friend Mark Whitlam, we even managed to recreate our own version of the tour titles for my own grand tour. Even referencing the nursery rhyme ending, substituting Pharaoh Jacca for Alouette. I'm really proud of this intro, so thanks, Mark. Long story short, you can watch every stage here. I rode 2,100 kilometers, climbed 21,000 meters in 21 days and raised 18 grand for the charity. It's the closest I'll ever get to being a tour rider, or so I thought, and so to a story I've never told. After a quick coffee, I'm heading to the station to begin a journey to Paris, but the journey to Paris isn't the only story that we've got here. So last year, when I decided to ride the Grand Tour, which was another story, I'll leave a link to a video about that stuff up here, I decided to try and raise some extra money on top of just normal donations by asking people for raffle prizes and things like that. Now, um, you always go in layers, don't you, and aim for premium stuff. So. I'd come across a rider called Tom Scoynes. Um, I was aware of him from uh, racing in the polka dot jersey in the Tour de France and uh, just being a name in the world tour. But he really, his sort of character came through in a couple of GCN videos that they put out during lockdown showing what the pros were doing. I decided today I'm gonna ride outside. If you want to call the cops, feel free to call them on you. But they're never gonna take me alive. <laughs> Why, hello. My name is Tom Skoinch, I am 28 and I am a professional cyclist for Trek Sigafredo. So I dropped him a line um, and he sent me a load of really nice goodies and also got in touch. And it turns out he wished he'd been a musician and kind of wished he'd played drums and stuff like that. So he had a, some interesting common ground and he was incredibly helpful along with Jacob there. Um, I think media manager is the right name, apologies if it's wrong. Um, sent me some signed Dauphiné jerseys and things like that. Basically, couldn't help me anymore. Uh, one of the things that Tom sent me was his skin suit from his fifth place in the Ruta del Sol in 2021, an amazing race where he really lit it up. Uh, and it turns out his race number was 76. I was born in 1976. So whilst the skin suit was a raffle prize, um, the, one of the dossards, which is the race numbers, uh, I took off and kept as a souvenir for myself for uh, doing what I did. Now. My plan is to see if I can get this dossard from where I am back to Tom's uh, in Paris for the, for the end of the Tour de France and see if I can get him to sign it. Now I have messaged uh, Jacob and he's going to do everything he said he can to try and get it done but 
I can't believe the chaos of what Paris is going to be like. I've only ever seen the, the tour finish on, on TV. So we will see how we get on. However, what will happen is this dossard is coming with me in my jersey pocket every single kilometer. Let's see how we get on. And get on, we did. If you want to watch the whole story about this, then I will leave a link at the end of the video. But on day one, we rode from London to Folkestone, chatting to the legends that are Brian Smith and James Golding, avoiding a first few day crashes and generally reveling in the closed roads and bunch riding. Following the ferry transfer and cleaning kit in the shower old school style, it was time for a well earned rest, ready for the next day's riding. So start stage two and Tom's number is pinned on the back of my race number. We are somewhere in Calais. Riding in France is always a pleasure and it was this day that my flat tyre resulted in my closest ever experience of world tour riding. Police escorts and a team of ride captains to pace me back, we kicked it a bit and generally reveled in every pedal stroke. I knew that this was once in a lifetime and I drank it in for as long as I could. This got us to the beautiful city of Amiens. The next day, pinning Tom's number to mine, I knew I'd be riding into Paris on closed roads. I knew I was very lucky to be doing this and no metre was taken for granted. As we got closer and the excitement rose, the city rose to meet us. Watching this footage back, I actually can't believe I was able to do this. We were in Paris. The final stage, if you want to call it that, saw us in an ultra privileged position. We were to ride the finish circuit, which was an actual life changing experience that I still can't put into words. I have tried, but I still can't. And then, well, it was time to watch the pros do it. We had tickets for a stand on the finish straight and I had Tom's number in my pocket, a bottle of water and Jacob's phone number. I would messaged him to say I was there, but this was the final day of the Tour de France in Paris. The only parallel I can come up with is it's like trying to get hold of Coldplay's tour manager to come and get a drum head to sign whilst they headline Glastonbury. This is not going to happen. Jumbo Visma celebrated winning and then... <laughs> Shortly after Jasper Philipson won the sprint, more messages from Jacob. Somehow, just somehow, it had worked out. Mate, I don't know what to say. Thank you so much don't for worry. your help. I don't know when I'll get it back to you, but I will. You got my address, right? I'll message you if I have. Thanks, mate. And he did have my address, and somewhere in the world, Tom signed it, and somewhere in the world, Jacob got in the post to me, and well, here it is. James, may our rides inspire more of your rides, and vice versa, Tom's. Somewhat ironically, on my way out of the compound, I actually finally met Tom's. Yeah. You're the one that helped me out so much last year, man. But, yeah, uh, no worries. Thank you so much. That was the ride over. Not as hard as yours. I didn't want to confuse matters by trying to get the number back from Jacob then and there for him to sign. As to say Tom's was tired, well, look. I got to meet a world tour rider shortly after finishing the tour. Do you have the faintest idea what that fact would have done to 10 year old me? I actually still have a bit of difficulty processing the whole thing. Toms, Jacob, you have no idea what you have done. Thank you so much.
So what is it about bike racing? I find it hard to really put into words. Sure, it's nostalgia, happy times in my life, possibly rose tinted, but the magic that the joy of bike racing bought me has also served me through the toughest times of my life. Perhaps a little like bike racing itself, the joy and elation of crossing the line first. I had genuine tears in my eyes for Roman Bardet on stage one with their edge of the seat breakaway, the tandem look behind by brothers in arms and the immediate gesture to his teammate, all within the blink of an eye, all of which are beautiful. And the idea of a British bike rider winning, well, Gamay's win trumps those perhaps. And as for Cav, well, there aren't the words. Taking the stage wind record with probably the greatest sprint I have ever seen. But equal to the joy and celebration is that the bike has been there through my deepest and darkest moments. I turn to riding when I don't know what else to do. When I was scared or angry, I just clipped in. When I didn't or don't know what the next day will bring, a pedal turn has a certainty to its outcome. You move forwards and perhaps that's what it is. Relentless forward progress. Perhaps you're pedaling squares up a seemingly never ending hill. Sometimes you're off balance and you know, you just know you're going down and it is gonna hurt. And sometimes you're freewheeling, flying along and everything is effortless, weightless and exhilarating. The point is, no climb or descent lasts forever and every pedal stroke moves you forward. Really, maybe I just don't have the words. Perhaps there aren't any. Often accompanied by a typically Gallic shrug, you sometimes hear people say, the tour is just the tour. And perhaps that's just how it is. It's certainly how it's always been. And long may it continue. Vive le tour.